Hello out there, everybody in Facebook land. I'm Anna Janine Kemper, your host for today's uh, Arts Connection series with the University of Akron's uh, School of Dance, Theater, and Arts Administration. And I'm here live with the director, assistant director, and two actors from the current production, Virginia Wolf's The Waves, which will be a virtual production. And if you'll notice, I thought I was live with four different people, but there are only three people here. And that's because Kennedy um, is serving as both an assistant director and as an actress in the show. So as we begin, I'd like to go around and ask each of you to please introduce yourself. Um, tell me how you got interested in theater and then tell me how you memorized your lines because that always seems to be an, a question that people want answers to. So just go ahead and tell us from the start. Kennedy, we'll start with you. Okay, um, I became interested in theater because of my uncle. Um, he took me to Playhouse Square in Cleveland once when I was in like eighth grade and I just never stopped going back. And it's actually my goal to work there someday um, in his honor. And um, I'm terrible at memorizing lines, but what I've that's why I'm a stage manager. Um, but what I tend to do is I'll get like note cards and just write them and just keep writing them and writing them. Um, but yeah, a little bit about me. <laughs> Drill it down. All right, Lysander, what about you? So um, my name's Lysander Mills. Uh, I got started in theater on my sophomore year of high school after I completely destroyed the entire right side of my body and I didn't want to hurt myself anymore. So I thought to myself, huh, theater sounds kind of fun. And wow, almost seven years later, um, I'm going to school for it. <laughs> I forget what we were supposed to say. <laughs> oh, lines, yes. <laughs> Ironic. Um, yeah, so when I memorize lines, it's kind of just repetition, 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 and then dividing it into my units and then my beats, and then just knowing my tasks every moment going into it. Yeah, repetition for me was always a thing too. I think I used to, um, I had like a, like a palm quarter. I remember I was in undergraduate several, a few years prior to you guys and I would record myself on my little palm quarter and then play it over and over again and listen to it. And then I would do the same thing as you Kennedy, I would write it down. And um, it would usually happen pretty quickly, but that was only because I did it a lot. It wasn't, it did not come without effort. <laughs> and what about you, Brian? Have you spent time on the stage? I actually have never asked you that. Um, I have, yeah. Uh, my background kind of comes from, from acting, uh, and I've kind of then transitioned into still interested in performance, but uh, kind of using the tools of acting towards uh, different kinds of research projects and asking kind of how uh, we can use theater to interact with the world in, in different ways. But yeah, uh, my background is in, in performance. That's amazing. I had no idea. I mean, you're. I mean, you're an accomplished director. Well, actually, why don't you tell us, uh, tell everybody a little bit about your background because I know, but they don't. Well, uh, I have, yeah, tell everybody about my background. Okay. Uh, I think I, I came kind of from a perspective of, of acting. That was my first interest in, in theater and I studied it in school acting and some directing and, and music and things like that. Um, after college, I, um, worked for a while with an Akron based company, the New World Performance Laboratory, uh, which at the time was in residence at the University of Akron. Um, and we were um, working, uh, the company kind of works in the broad uh, tradition of a Polish director, Jerzy Grotowski. Uh, the, the directors, Jim Sloviak and Jairo Cuesta had been collaborators of his and, and my interest in Grotowski had been actually how I had initially found them. And after a couple of years of working with that company, I, I felt like there were unanswered questions I had about his legacy, some of the, the things that had brought up. And so I, I went to do a PhD uh, in which I continued to investigate that legacy, but took on kind of uh, creative research to try to, um, uh, to, to try to explore some of those questions really around how um, 
how you could take the skills of performance uh, to interact with environments uh, and did a lot of work outside and things like that, as well as kind of theoretical work. So that's sort of the approach now that I, I take into directing is that, uh, yeah, I'm putting on a show and this is, uh, this is about a script, but it's also a kind of question into to sort of how we use these skills of actors to relate to the world. That's great. Um, so the show that we're doing right now is not a traditional script. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you chose that uh, play poem and where it came from? Well, the, the play comes from a novel, The Waves by Virginia Woolf. Um, and it's a very unusual novel in that it, it's spoken through the voice of its six different characters, but not so much in, in kind of traditional dialogue, but in almost like a stream of consciousness, I would say, uh, of what's going on in their head at, at various different points of the novel. And I had first read it a couple of years ago and it just really made a very deep impression on me, something that I knew I wanted to kind of come back to and look at uh, in a deeper way. I had even worked with a little bit of the text uh, for some of my acting work and things like that, Ex explored some of it before. And as I was thinking about what could be done, what was would be worth doing in a a very unusual pr process during a pandemic. Uh, I kind of thought back to the waves and its structure because I felt like what was so meaningful about it for me was the way in which the characters who in some ways are very isolated in the way that I felt during this pandemic kind of fall back on the smallest details of their sensory life in the way that I felt like I was doing uh, during that time. The things that they, I was eating, the, the, the world around me. And that, and that felt like, in terms of a play to work on during the, the, perspective, the, the pandemic, that was a place to start. Uh, was from that, that small sensory detail and that this text should be a chance to, to work with that. Very cool. So you, talk, you talked a little bit about some of the sensory elements of the play without giving too much away so that people will still want to come see the play. No spoilers, please. Tell us a little bit about um, the, the plot line or, you know, something that you feel like you could give away for, for the show. I think I can give things away. I don't think it, give, it works that much on suspense um, so much. Uh, and in some ways, there's not much to give away because there's not a whole lot of plot, really. It's, it follows the life of six friends through different points in their life and picks them up kind of from when they're children to when they're going through different periods of school into their older adulthood. And it kind of checks in on them uh, at these various points. And how they're friendship has evolved kind of during that time. Particularly there's times when after they've been scattered, they come back together. And those are some of the key moments in the play. Um, some of the plot maybe revolves around their relationship to a seventh character who is not played by an actor and never speaks in the play. Uh, his name is Percival. Uh, and they all have some kind of relation to him. Uh, one character is in love with him. Uh, others have different kinds of friendships uh, with Percival. And uh, in the middle, halfway through their lives, he, he dies in an accident in, in India. So some of the latter part of the play kind of deals with how they all differently deal with the loss of their friend uh, as their, their six friendships uh, remain. Sander and Kennedy, uh, am I leaving anything out that's important? What would you add about the, the plot of the play? I think you you really like hit it hit the head, hit the nail on the head there. Um, I don't really think you missed anything. Yeah, without <clears throat> without spoiling anything, yeah, you, you 
You got to read on the nose. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm not reading the work as much as you guys are, but I, that very well encapsulated my understanding of what's happening as well. Um, so Kennedy, I'll speak to you first. Tell me a little bit about your character, Susan, and tell me about especially how Susan is like you and how Susan is different from you. Um, she's a very grounded character. Um, she knows what she wants and um, she also, she, she is at peace, um, but it depends on what part of her life. She, in, she's similar to me in the fact that she, you know, counts down days. She, she, when she's excited about something, she's excited about it. She knows what she wants and she knows how to get it. She's very much not like me because she um, enjoys living on a farm and having children. That is not something I want to do with my life. Um, but that has been like my biggest challenge is trying to connect with a character who is just in, in this grounded place of like, you know what, this is where I am in my life. And it's not exactly what I dreamed of, but it's here. But I feel like all of us can kind of connect to that at some point. Well, we hope we can make it there anyway, um, <laughs> because that's the place you are. My, my mother used to have a, a coffee mug when I was a kid that said, just remember, no matter where you go, there you are. And I thought that's very true. It's silly, but it's very true also. Uh, what about you, Lysander? Tell us about your character. So um, I play Bernard in the show. Uh, Bernard is a very, to me, probably one of the most complex characters I've played between playing characters like Hitler, for example, that I've played in the past, but... um, That's right. Lysander played Arturo Ui in our, the Resistible Rise of Arturo Ui last fall at the University of Akron. Yeah. The energy feels very much the same between that character and this one in the sense that there's always a sense of, like, searching. There's always this desire to fully try to, like, express oneself as far as they can which is something that I try to do quite often. But one thing that Bernard does that's really difficult for me is he talks, his brain works faster than his mouth can actually process, which usually when I talk, I just want to get straight to the point because I don't really see a point in using long flowery language to say, I want water, which might be something he would do. But um, yeah, no, it's, it's been a really interesting process of getting into playing Bernard like this. Well, I love, I love hearing about actors and their, their process to get into character. That's always a very cool. Um, what's the rehearsal process like? This is a really different set of circumstances than any of us were in during our shows last year, whether it was Richard III or whether it was, um, you know, Arturo Ui in the fall prior. Richard III, as many of you may or may not know, um, was, was, you know, pulled out of the theater halfway through its run because our, um, because our whole state shut down. So our actors only got their, their first weekend of performance and the circumstances that we're operating under aren't a lot different in the world now than they were then, except now we're a little bit more prepared to try to stage a virtual production, whereas then it was just kind of a rug being pulled out of out from under us little surprise that we didn't know was around the corner. But now that we have had that time to prepare, even with that, um, it's still not the same as having a face-to-face -face rehearsal, I would imagine. What, what's the difference like? How does it feel? And, and how do you guys do it? Dude, Kennedy, why don't you talk about how we do it? Okay, um, so for rehearsals, basically on Sundays, um, what we've been doing is it'll be an all cast rehearsal. Um, and then Brian will be, he will go over, you know, hey, I want these two pairings, because there's only six people in the cast. So he'll be like, I want these two, you know, this night, and then he'll go through the schedule. And then I will go and send links through um, Google Calendar and then when in the rehearsal process, um, what, I, what I've experienced the most is basically like 20 minute sessions. So for 20 minutes, I work with Brian and then I work on my own while he's working with Sander. And we don't really go into breakout rooms. We just kind of mute ourselves. Um, but it's, it's basically like a one-on-one. -on -one. And what we've started doing, especially me and Sander, 
um, because we are sort of interested in each other at some parts. Um, but we have um, started working on like movements on based on what the other person is saying. So that um, that part we do together. And then we are hoping um, to actually start some in-person rehearsals later this month. Um, and we are going to be doing our recording rehearsals this week, um, at the end of the week. And that is gonna help us um, when we do our live performance. Awesome. Um, for those of you out there in Facebook land who might be just joining us, my name is Anna Jean Kemper. I'm an arts administrator with the University of Akron, and I'm here with the cast and production team, part of the cast and part of the production team, for um, this season's production of Virginia Woolf's The Waves, which will be a virtual production. Um, just because it's, you know, about about a quarter after the hour, I want to go ahead and do a quick promotion for how to get tickets to this show. So a couple of things you should know. One, it is totally virtual, so you can come and enjoy the performance from the comfort of your own living room. But two, just like any other play, we do have agreements uh, for licensing, so seating is limited. Um, there won't be an unlimited number of tickets, so you should get them now if you're interested in coming. We're going to be running on the evenings of November 5th, 6th, and 7th. That's a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Um, and then we'll also have a matinee on uh, Sunday the 8th at 2 p.m. And if you're a school, there's a special school matinee that's happening on Friday at 10 a.m. So if you're interested in learning more about that school matinee, please um, send us a message through the uh, Dance Theater and Arts Administration schools page. We'll, we'll send you more information about that. But if you are just a regular person who would like a ticket, go to thewavesua.eventbrite.com and you can get tickets for that. Register, register soon, register early, and get your tickets because we want to make sure that there's a seat saved for you. Um, next, I want to ask you, Kennedy, I want you to tell me about your responsibilities in the process of managing this virtual production and how they've been different from how you would usually stage manage or be an assistant director, because I know there's been um, changes there. You talked about that a little bit in your last yeah. year. So I just want to make um, sure you didn't miss anything. Honestly, this is a lot more challenging. Um, being a stage manager is always hard, but your first, especially like when actors are late or something and they don't show up, usually you give them a call. Well, we are already kind of calling. So it's like whatever platform they're using, you're like, I, mm, I don't know where they are. Um, but Usually the stage manager, I'm more responsible, and it depends on the director, but I'm usually more responsible for like charts and graphs and all the behind the, all the props, all of the, everything that anyone touches, I'm responsible for. But since we're in a touchless world at this point, it's more of me doing like, hey, make sure you're coming to this rehearsal. Hey, did you get this email? Hey, did you send your bios in? Like all of the, which I always do, but for some reason, um, I find this more draining and it's probably just because of like the constant online atmosphere, but just even sending the email, I'm such a, I'm a type of stage manager that does everything on paper. Like I will give out schedules on paper. And so like having to navigate being a stage man manager virtually has been like really challenging. Um, but, and there are some days I'm just like, I don't know what you want me to do, but I'll just, I'm here. So just tell me what you want. <laughs> Um, but it's been, it's been nice also being like the assistant director in a way because I've been able to make um, choices and have discussions with Brian and even the people at ZTV who are going to be helping us. So I am still getting that like backstage um, experience. And I feel like as we grow um, and go into in-person rehearsals, as well as even this week with our recordings, I'm going to be more of a stage manager and less of just like a, yes, I made sure everyone was here. <laughs> Right. So um, as you're as you're working with your characters, Lysander, this is a question for you and for Kennedy. Um, and I'm going to switch to you first because it hasn't been your turn for a little while. <laughs> I want to talk to you um, as you're as you're doing character work. You're you're working out of your own homes. You're working out of your own your own chair that you usually sit in to do homework or watch TV. And how do you kind of um, how do you compartmentalize that? How do you um, help yourself get into character when you're in such a familiar space? I know that in, in my past, I've acted a lot. And usually when I'm acting, I'm, 
I'm on the stage. And usually when I'm at home, I'm acting like myself. But you guys are using a, you know, combined spaces um, that you're, you're normally in, in a, in a different role as yourself. How do you kind of bridge that gap? What are the, what are the secrets? Are there things that you do to get in character? Do you burn a special candle or drink out of a secret mug or how does it work? So this one's been a, a little more difficult for me because usually when like I get into a character, I usually think about where I am in the space, where I am in the world that is on stage at this point. And since I haven't, it's it's a little harder because we haven't had a defined space of where the production's going to be. It makes it a little harder to picture the realm that I'll be in. So usually when I'm going through and trying to think of my goals, my tasks within the uh, scene, I kind of just picture a movie going on in my head. Like if I were like on stage, what would I be doing at this moment? So it's kind of like, I'm just imagining this moment is happening like this. So I kind of entered like this, like blank trance like state up here. So I'm just zoned out and just, if I were on stage, this is what I would be doing. But since I can't be on stage, I'm not doing that. And then there's a one part in the show where I have a very kind of lengthy monologue towards the end, um, which it's eh, eh, um, it's finding the subtleties in the way of acting because we're on this such small of a, I don't want to say small of a medium, but small of a space, even though the medium's huge, let's be honest. But um, the physical space we're in is small. So we have to pay attention to more of the details that we can put into it. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And I mean, just as somebody who has and is currently working from home, I know that sometimes it's, you know, that, that overlap and like finding a space for each you know, part is, is challenging. Mm -hmm. Kenneth, what about you? Do you have any special advice to offer any actors who are working on virtual roles like this? No, um, I struggle a lot. Um, I'm a resident assistant on campus. And so my room is also my kitchen, my bedroom. It's, it's literally everything. Um, literally right before we started, I had residents knocking on my door asking me questions and I can tell them, hey, you know, I'm in rehearsal, but they're freshmen. They always need help. But I, what I always end up doing is like, it takes me the first 15 minutes of like rehearsal to be like, I'm in this show right now. I'm this role. Like I'm just doing so much and then trying to balance, am I the stage manager? Am I the assistant director? Am I an actor? And I'm an, am, like, I'm just like, sometimes I'm like, and so Brian's like Kennedy just breathe a and then just read it a few times because like I tend to get into it once I stop thinking about it I just overthink all of it and um it's very very difficult especially like I'm in an acting class and they want us to transform these spaces and I'm like where like where do you want me to put all my furniture it's only so big so that's been a really big challenge for me because I don't have like a living room that I can like mix up my classes with um so that's very challenging for sure well going back to what you said earlier there's something about the text that makes it incredibly easy to like picture what's going on mm -hmm. because of how it's written and how brian has constructed the yeah. novel into a script so that, i think that takes a little weight off our shoulders especially with this production mm -hmm. And that's something that I noticed too in, in working with the actors that um, sometimes like the first time through a section, it's like they're a little bit not there. It's um, kind of haven't fully entered the world, but then they get through that first read and the, um, the text itself kind of takes them there and then all I need to do is ask them to do it again and it's like they're they're in it because I think the text with its imagery has that kind of has that kind of transporting power yeah it's it's very surprising the um 
for those of you who are just joining us in Facebook land, <laughs> the, um, the, the text itself um, comes from a novel by Virginia Woolf, and it, she didn't even call it a novel. If you are to call it a novel, you must call it an experimental novel, I think, because it really is an unusual piece in her body of work. She did not call it a novel. She called it a play poem. Um, and it, it really is in itself organized as, um, as monologues or as soliloquies from each of those six characters rather than as dialogue and descriptive text. So when you take away the novel shell, you're not missing a lot of that descriptive text that we would usually be trying to figure out how to work back into the dialogue. So that's really, it, it's really interesting. I, I was wondering, do you know, Brian, have, have, has anybody performed this before? Are there other theater companies around the world who have, you know, seen you know, the breadcrumbs that she left and, and had the good sense to put it on stage or are you the first? I don't think I'm the first. I don't think there's been a wide range. Yeah. Um, I think uh, um, I know there have been small productions and things here and there. I think the um, uh, probably the most prominent one was the great British director, Katie Mitchell, did a production in 2012. And there's not a lot of information about that production. I think in a kind of typical of Katie Mitchell's style, it was very tech heavy. Uh, I mean, in some ways it may not have some similarities to what we're doing in that like performers on camera uh, a lot, uh, so that's probably been the most um, the most prominent production. Uh, one of the, uh, the the new faculty for this year had mentioned that she had been in a, a version uh, in like a fringe festival in Toronto. Wow! Uh, so she shared the script for that, which was okay. nice to see how somebody else had Great. adapted this. Um, but I would say probably the Katie Mitchell would be the most um, uh, the most prominent one, but I'm sure there have been others too, just because, as you said, there's, it is all written through the voice of these characters. So I think there's something about it that feels theatrical, uh, even though it wasn't necessarily written to be performed as a play. Hey, Kennedy, it looks like we got a question from Facebook land. Guys, if you're out there and you have any questions for us, please feel free to put them over here in the comments because I am reading those. Um, you were asked in particular, Kennedy, is there anything specific that you did to prepare for your role since it feels different than yourself? Um, that's what I'm still trying to figure out. Um, have you considered buying a farm and getting some children? No. no. Um, I will say I did some, um, there's a scene where um, I'm kind of interacting with a baby and I like just could not put myself there. And so um, I did in fact use one of my lovely kangaroos to kind of get myself in the drastic times call for drastic measures. So um, that I don't, that's what I'm really struggling with. Um, I grew up in a rural area, so I am thinking about a lot of that, um, but it's, I guess that's the challenge of acting being someone you're not, so. Right, absolutely. That that reminds me of that famous, uh, what that famous Laurence Olivier uh, quote, you know, have you tried acting? I don't know if you, you guys have ever heard that story, but it's a, it's a good one, a conversation that supposedly happened between he and Dustin Hoffman during the filming of Marathon Man, I think, um, when Dustin Hoffman had been up all night and you know, he was like, why did you do that? And Dustin Hoffman's like, well, I'm trying to get into character. And Lawrence Olivier said, well, have you tried acting? Um, I don't know if that story is true, but I've heard it several times. And I've I always mean, thought it was funny. <laughs> we're like, to, like, we're taught um, to, to get into something. You need to use your given circumstances. You need to think about, you know, what if scenarios. Um, another thing that uh, we've, I've worked on is like, you can't feel an emotion on stage. Um, something that I've been taught is that if you win the lottery and then five minutes later you have to be opening a show crying, like you can't act that, you can't act that sadness. So it's a lot of like, what am I physically doing? What would I physically do if I was in Susan's shoes right now and felt sad? So I just 
do what I do when I'm sad. And that's kind of where I go with that process. Sure. That's really, that's a really interesting reflection, especially as, you know, I'm sure that there are actors out there who are watching this, who are saying, you know, is it a, is it a Stanislavski system, uh, you know, strategy, or is it a Meisner method strategy, right? And if you have a situation where that you haven't been in that you can't figure out how to, um, how to create a, a parallel in your head, you kind of do have to do that research, don't you? You have to go out and, you know, cuddle your, your baby kangaroo, um, <laughs> or you have to, to interview a child. You're welcome to interview my child, by the way. <laughs> you'd like to know what it's like to talk Thank to you. Um, he's available for consult, uh, has theater experience. Um, but I think that, yeah, we're all in, we're encountering lots of new, new things. And of course, anytime you're playing someone who's not you, you're going to be experiencing new things. And it sounds like it's just a matter of kind of getting out there and doing the research. So that's the answer, people. Go, go out there and do the emotional research. That's really what we're talking about, isn't it? Emotional research, that's fascinating. I think one thing that we've experimented with, because it is a big challenge, especially because for a play like this where there's not a lot of like direct interaction between the characters, it takes away a lot of your primary tools as an actor, which is to try to get what you want from the other character. That's kind of what acting is about. And that kind of main tool is taken away uh, in this play. So. I think all the actors have had to been be creative in sort of trying to find other ways in uh, to these things. And we've tried things like certainly like kind of substitution uh, where, you know, if this particular image doesn't mean anything specific to you, can you find something in your own life that you feel about in, the, in an analogous way to the way your character feels about this? And and I think what Kennedy said about the, the actions, what would you do in the situation is a, is a really key one too. So it's, it's a challenge, but I mean, everyone is kind of coming to it in their own way and I'm trying in my little way to help them. Uh, but that's, that's been a big, uh, big challenge of this production. The theater has lost so much in, in recent months, all kinds of live performance and live events have. Um, but I think that Interesting, interestingly enough, um, in the act of stripping down what we're doing to formats like this, I think there are really some things that we've gained too. Will you talk about what some of those things that we've gained through doing virtual performance are, Brian? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I feel like it'd be a stretch to say there's things that we've gained. Um, I think there's some things that maybe we've had an opportunity to discover, or maybe not or not discover, but to kind of look back at and, uh, and reinvestigate um, would be how I would put it. And I think maybe one of them that's come very clear for me is uh, the question of what it means to be kind of neutral uh, on stage or in life to sort of come to a place where you're maybe not doing anything directly, but you're totally receptive to the kinds of stimulus that might come in from the world, from the text and things like that. And uh, I think that in the world of acting where a lot is focused on, you know, what do I do in relation to my partner? How do I get what I want uh, from the other character in the scene? And rightly so, that's what makes good acting. That um, you can get away from a kind of primal place of receptivity. And I think that the, the virtual format where so things that are very small and subtle can be visible in a way that is not necessarily on a, on a big stage. And the kind of interest in sensory detail that I think this play in particular, but, but, but virtual uh, theater in general kind of brings about, I think asks us to look for that kind of neutral, that starting place, that origin place of creativity in 
in an interesting and kind of exciting way. So what I got from you just then was, was talk, some talk about stripping down to our roots. And it's an interesting thing to think about because I think when I first began this project, I was afraid that this was going to turn into a film production. It wasn't going to be theater anymore. But over this process, I've learned as an arts administrator that that's not true. It's still not film. It still is live theater. And it's still very different than a film uh, a film project simply because we don't have that starting and stopping camera. We don't have that shifting uh, perspective. And what I'm really excited about with this format as an audience member um, is actually that I'll be able to see the actors' faces. <laughs> so that's something that you, you don't always have the luxury of in any theater environment. You're not always so up close with the actors to be able to experience um, such a, a close encounter with the emotions on their face. And I'm really excited about getting to see some of that, I guess. Um, I guess I'm kind of a nerd for that sort of thing. So I'm really excited about that opportunity that it's gonna offer to us. Brian, there's a question for you in the comments. So I'm gonna read it to you. It says, Brian, how are you thinking about directing actors on camera versus being together on stage? And how are you directing them to engage with the camera? That's a great question. Um, and I mean, it's a challenging question for me because I mean, when I talked about my background, what really isn't there is any film work. Right, I haven't done uh, it either, so this is all new. So I, I'm not kind of coming at this from a, a camera acting perspective. I do know that there are certain opportunities that we have acting on the camera, that certain types of, of things can be seen, uh, which wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise be seen. Um, and there's a little bit where I'm going to kind of give a slightly, not give everything away uh, in terms of <laughs> what actually happens in, in the play. Uh, but I think, uh, but I think in, in general, and for a lot of the, the action, the way I'm, I'm looking at the role of the camera is a kind of, uh, as a kind of window for the audience into the private world uh, of these characters. So there isn't a lot of sort of direct engagement with the camera on the part of the actors, uh, but somewhat in the way that like, right now or something like that in the, in the pandemic, these cameras take us into the private spaces uh, of people. Um, the camera in this production is going to take you into the kind of private psychological world of these characters, which you'll hear in their words and you'll see in their physicality. Um, so, I think it, a lot of what it ends up being is kind of thinking in terms of smallness, thinking in terms of subtlety for the actors that you don't have to too, do too much because you know that the camera is going to be right there getting every detail. Um, and that's, that offers you an opportunity. Um, I feel it feels like a rambling answer to that question, but no, There's some of the things great. I'm thinking about in terms of, of the camera and a great I, I question. I don't think it was rambling at all. I think that was a great answer to that question, spot on. That question came from um, our, uh, our our program advisor, Arnie Tonstall, who is um, the director of the Emily Davis Gallery over in the, the School of Art. Um, thanks, Arnie, for that great question. Um, as you guys have worked on this project, and this kind of is for really all three of you, Tell, tell us about how working on a virtual performance has expanded your, your creativity as a director, as a performer. Um, you know, what challenges have you faced um, and what, what elements of those, uh, those coping mechanisms are you going to take with yourself as things go, you know, back to normal <laughs> um, and will ultimately make you a better director or performer? What strengths have you gained during this process? Patience. <laughs> um, especially because we, our technology, like we are at the hands of our technology. We never know whose is gonna work, who we can see. 
Um, I definitely with the stage managing aspect, um, maybe I'll go a little bit less paperless, but I think it's really showed me that I need an in-person schedule because I can send as many links and I can give them a full calendar and they still say, I didn't get the email. So when I hand it to them physically, I'm like, I gave it to you. I know you have it. Um, but as a performer, one thing that we're always told is to leave your baggage at the door. So if you're having a bad day, by the time you are you know, on stage and acting, your bad day is not your character's bad day. However, um, it's a lot harder to do that when your day is still kind of around you. You're not in the theater anymore. You don't, there's no, you have to leave your door, like you have to leave your baggage at a virtual door, but it's, you're in your own room. It's still all around you. So that's been something that I really, really struggle with. Um, but luckily we have mute, um, which is something we don't have in live theater. Um, so that's just kind of what I've been doing, but it's definitely hard leave my baggage at the door. This is where I keep my baggage. <laughs> this is the baggage keeping place. Yeah. Yeah. Completely for that. <laughs> what about you, Lysander? What do you think? Um, so for me as a performer, I've kind of gotten like, I guess, two general things that have, I think I'll take with me from um, henceforth. And one is how I connect with the text because a lot of the process we've been doing up to this point has been a lot of text work, but I can't really do a lot of the physicality behind it right now. So in trying to like do the action I'm going for with just words has made a really interesting discovery for me to, uh, to go through with all this. Um, Jeez, I can't even remember the other one. I guess it wasn't that important. <laughs> well, if it, if it comes back to you, just, you know, interrupt us and talk about that again. That's no, nobody's keeping score about if we stay on topic here. <laughs> what, what about you, Brian? What do you think? I think you might be muted, Brian. Thank you. Sorry. There's people blowing leaves and things like that. So I've been, uh, I think one of the, the, what I found particularly challenging has been around the, the physical work. And it's been a little bit, we've been in a two part process because we're doing a sound recording of a lot of the, the text. Mm -hmm. And so the rehearsal process has been kind of front loaded sound uh, and front loaded text. And now once that's recorded, we're gonna do, be doing a lot more um, physical work. Uh, but I think it's that physical work that's been challenging for me. And I find like how much I relied on, not necessarily like that I would, I've never been the kind of act, the director who would like act something out and ask the actors to do it, but some kind of exchange of energy or putting together a kind of sequence of physical activities that would kind of, uh, bring the actors into the place that I wanted them. And that kind of, the, the sort of exchange of energy I find hard to, to make happen as a director through the screen. And I find that I need to rely much more on being very precise in my notes, in my, in my prompts, because the, the words and the meaning of the words have to carry something that is going to, to help the actors get at what I'm, what I'm trying to help them experience. Uh, and I think through the process, I am gradually bit by bit improving on that. Uh, and I think it's something that having gone through it, uh, I'll, I'll be stronger at really using my words in an intentional way. Mm -hmm. I remembered what it was. Yes, for, I knew you were going as, to. As soon as Brian spoke, I was like, oh, yeah, that's what it was. So one of the techniques that I like to do before I start a scene is um, visualize, radiate, do. So visualize what I'm about to do. Radiate it until like I can't hold it in anymore, and then I do it. But unfortunately, since we're in this space, there's no do so it's just a lot of radiate until it feels like the text just explodes out so i think without 
being able to do the do action, <laughs> it really makes it so I'm able to connect more with what I'm supposed to be doing. Like how I can deliver this text, how I can fully express what I'm trying to say. So I think that was a better connection with that process. That's perfect. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to do another quick short uh, promotion for tickets for the show here. Um, we're at about 45 minutes after the hour, so we're only going to be with you for probably another 15 minutes more. Um, if you are as excited about seeing this show as I am, and I really truly am, it is going to be a live production, a live performance, even though it's virtual. Um, you can get tickets for this show right now. You can, you can save your virtual seat right now from your computer. Just open up a new tab and go reserve a ticket. Um, tickets are free, but seating is limited. We are capping each performance. So please go and reserve your seat now if you're interested in, in coming to see this. Uh, you can go to thewaves.ua.eventbrite.com and reserve those seats for free and have them waiting for you. Um, this is gonna be showing on November 5th, 6th and 7th in the evening. That's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We will also have a Sunday matinee. And if you're a school, there is going to be a special school matinee on Friday. So if you're interested in learning more about that school matinee, those tickets are not available on Eventbrite. You will need to message the School of Dance, Theater and Arts Administration separately. So please get in touch with us. We will give you all the details about bringing your school children to that. Um, I'm going to take another question from the comments over here. Um, what's the mentality of this cast feel like? What's the culture of being in this cast? When, when you're in an in-person cast, it's always like there's this very sort of team spirit thing that happens. And Brian, you were talking about how, you know, sometimes it's difficult to um, get the, you know, the playoff that we usually have live on stage because, you know, actors are separate. But what's the team feel like? Do you guys still have a, that camaraderie or has that been lost to cyberspace? Tell us, tell us what that's been like. I think it's definitely um, a case by case basis. I know for me, um, especially like with Sander, this is like my third year doing productions with him. So we're already going into like this production, knowing each other, knowing, you know, what makes each other laugh, knowing how to get each other through a rough rehearsal. Um, we do have, um, I believe one freshman, one so two sophomores maybe, I don't remember. But um, we do have one person that's brand new to the program, but luckily Sandra and I have class with her in person. Um, and so we know, we all know each other, but we're definitely, there's definitely that missing like connection of, hey, we're all in this together in the like, yes, we have group rehearsals, but like it's rare that things are as funny when they are in person. It's kind of like one of the, you had to be there type things, except we were there, it just wasn't funny. Um, so yeah. So it sounds like there is still, you know, quite a bit of shared connect connection, maybe not as strong as the, it would be in person, but especially because it's a small cast, it seems like there's an advantage there. It's not like we're doing a production of Camelot, you know, and there's, <laughs> there's 90 people in the chorus and then like five people who have speaking roles. It's not like that. There's, you know, there's six of you and it, it's pretty balanced in terms of how much, um, how much stage time and how many lines you have, at, at least in terms of, you know, every role is large and significant. Um, <laughs> if you take an, an hour long play and divide it by six, that's 10 solid minutes of a person talking and that's a lot of stage time. You're not going to see that, um, you know, as an actor in very many productions in any role. So that's, um, that's a pretty, what do they call that? It's an ensemble cast, really. It's mm -hmm. an ensemble cast piece. Um, what about you, Lysander? How are you, or how are you feeling? Isolated in general, but is there still some team spirit happening? I think the way that I usually go about theater, and this is going back to the process, is I'm usually, I try to do the scene for my partner which not being able to do that in this show has made it quite hard. And I only end up like truly interact with two people, one of which being Kennedy and the other one being Neville. I haven't seen the other two actors in about two weeks. Uh, three, the other three actors in, <laughs> in about two weeks. So for me, I feel quite distant from them as compared to 
the other two. So I, I guess that kind of happens with like a lot of shows though. It, you're kind of just secluded to, you're allowed to talk to these people because <laughs> you're on stage with these people and they're usually off stage with you when you're gone, you know? So to me, I, I feel very disconnected from them until we're actually in a scene together. That makes perfect sense. Uh, yeah, that that makes perfect sense. And I've experienced that um, in live shows too. You're absolutely right. You're <laughs> you're very astute to observe that. That wow. I mean <laughs> get a gold star. Um, so as for the three of you, um, what are some of the most useful things that you've learned working on the waves? Are, is there any advice that you'd give to other theater practitioners who are you know, thinking about embarking on a voyage like this one, could you help them get started? What are some of the things that you would tell them? Your platform is important. Um, we started off, I think we were using like WebEx and it's a good program, but like, depending on what internet you're using, it can be awful. Um, so that your internet is extremely important, making sure that you have constant connection. There have been times we've been in rehearsal and Brian's like, yo, I can't see this person. And I'm like, I can. And the rest of the cast is like, I can. So it's honestly just kind of like when you're in a production and you have to get all your basics, like, all right, where are my props? All of that. You kind of have to do that virtually as well. Like, is my internet connected? Is my sound working? All of those things. I know we've had a few problems with like, people being muted when they don't know it or um, people's like microphones making weird static noises. So it's kind of like you have to do your sound check, mic check, all of that, but before every rehearsal instead of before every performance. Yeah, ex that's exactly right. Um, we've been really lucky to be able to work with the, um, the good people at uh, Zip TV is that ZTV? ZTV. <laughs> ZTV. A ZTV. Um, they're going to be producing our our video for this show. Um, they're bringing in all the professional grade um, camera equipment and sound equipment that we need to be able to focus on our art. And as an arts administrator, that's what attracted me to this field is that I want to help artists be able to focus on their art and not have to be cluttered down with business sorts of things that stress them out and prevent them from being able to focus on their art. So ZTV is coming in and providing the things to us that are outside of our wheelhouse so that we can focus on our theater art. And we're tremendously grateful to them for their help. Um, on that note, Brian, would you take a minute to talk to everybody about how this is being um, produce like how it's happening, what the process is of each night, the actors um, going live at the theater so that everybody will know about how that, um, how that live broadcast is gonna work. Well, um, it's going to be live broadcast from, uh, from Dom Theater uh, where the actors will be uh, masked and socially distanced as as we need to be in, in these times. And I think even though the, the play is happening in a theater, which I kind of like, it gives that, that sort of aesthetic, oh, we're in a theater. Uh, it's not going to be staged in the sense that you would go to see a theater and see people moving around the stage and, and interacting with each other. The the actors are going to be more or less, and there's still things I'm not totally giving away, but more or less uh, fixed in, in their place as if they were in their own spaces. Uh, but the, the camera will show different groups, groupings of them, kind of like we're, we're shown in this in Zoom call. I mean, there'll be times when the camera is really focusing on one actor uh, because they're the, the important things, that they're the, the sort of important person uh, for that moment. But there'll also be times when maybe you'll be hearing one character's voice, but you'll be seeing several actors and the way they're all responding to the same stimulus uh, that that the speaking uh, actor is, is responding to. Uh, so the, the sort of the angles, the views, the, uh, the perspective on different characters will shift 
uh, through the course of the evening to kind of take you through uh, these different characters' perspectives. That's great. I, I'm so excited about the way we're producing this because like I said, my, my background is in live theater, not in film. So approaching this was was challenging for me as well. I didn't know how we were going to make this happen. And the, the technical element of it was daunting. So once we got these solutions together, um, I've been really excited about seeing how it's going to turn out. And I'm so excited about the way we've been able to preserve the, the live element and the personal element of what's, what's happening, even using a film media to make it more like theater and, and less like film. Not that film is bad. It's just, we do, we do theater. This is the thing we do, specialization of labor, right? There are other people who do film who are trying to do live theater. And I think it's great that we've been able to, to preserve that. And I'm really excited about how it's going to turn out. Um, it's 2.55. Any final thoughts, guys? Or is there anything that you're thinking about that you would like to make sure that, that your prospective audience knows as they're making a decision to go and reserve tickets for this show, you guys? It's at thewaves.ua. Dot, excuse me, thewavesua.eventbrite.com. <laughs> go get your tickets. <laughs> I would say this would probably be the most unique online show that you will see do doing theater. It really does have a lot of feathers in its cap. I mean, it's a it's a show that's been adapted from a novel that isn't, you know, it isn't traditionally presented this way. It sounds like it has been presented a couple of times in this format, but certainly not a, not a lot. Um, I, I consider myself to be a Virginia Woolf fan and I had not heard of this work previously. Neither had um, one of the other GAs who considers herself to be a, a Virginia Woolf fan. Shout out to Spring Healy, um, our dance coordinator who does my job for the dance program. Um, we, we both are big fans of Virginia Woolf. Her, um, her undergraduate degree is in English, I believe. And we weren't familiar with this work, so had the opportunity to read it uh, just you know, at the beginning of this, this production series. So it's got that in its favor. We're, we're producing it in a unique way. We're, uh, we've got a great cast. We've got a great director. <laughs> Obviously, those are, are in our favor. I really do think that this is going to be a great show, and I'm excited about seeing it. What about you, Brian and Kennedy? Any final thoughts? I think for me, sorry. <laughs> um, just like, it's not gonna be the same as what you've experienced before. You're not in that live theater aspect, but just like us as actors, if you put yourself there, you will enjoy it a lot more. I think, I, I mean, what I wanted to say, I think kind of comes off of that, which is that because of the nature of, of the text and the way it is, there's so much richness and, and density to it. Um, having read it like several times and done the adaptation and hear, hear the actors read it many, many times, I'm still like, picking up on things that I've never noticed through the rehearsal process. And so what I would say is, don't worry about getting it all. It's like, just, just swim in the waves um, and trust that what you need to hear is, is going to come through. I think there's something to really speak directly to everybody in this play. Uh, and I kind of have to have faith as a director. And I think it's true that when you come, that you're going to discover and find and encounter the thing that you need to discover uh, in, in this play. Those, I think those are great words to close with. Everybody, thank you so much for joining me to the, to the three of you, um, really sincerely, deeply from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for joining me for this. This has been informative for me. And I can't imagine how informative it's been for everybody out there who's watching this, who isn't familiar with what we're doing. Everybody out there in Facebook land, please go to thewavesua.eventbrite.com and reserve your tickets. They are free, but they are limited. You can check out the dates there. And to Brian Schultes, our director, to Kennedy Hall, who's our assistant director slash actress, and to Lysander Mills, who is also an actor in the show. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. And good afternoon, everybody. Have a great one.